can blame Daniel for tanking, of course. I mean, he's facing a $41,000 bet into a pot of 13K, right? So I really have to think that one through. We've got Doug raising on the button to 910, hipster sizing, but it's a good one. King 7 3 is a very dry board, not really much happening. The 7 and the 3 don't hit either player super hard. I guess the 7 somewhat does. The king is very good for both of them. Obviously, more so for Doug. He's gonna have most of the he's gonna have all of the big kings, whereas Daniel, if he had a hand like King Queen Suit or Ace King, would obviously three bet. So I'm expecting a lot of C bets by Doug. Mostly smaller C bets. Daniel checks, and Doug will, I think, bet around 600. Let's see if I'm right about this one. Okay, see, he just had to defy me, right? He's going to bet a lot. He's betting small, but instead of just betting 600, so I look like a genius, he had to make it 763. Okay, 763. Not much of a difference. V8 is definitely good for Doug. A lot of his hands, like 8, 9, and whatnot, 5, 6, now pick up an open ender or a pair. Daniel is not going to be floating a whole lot of 8 highs. If he had a, has a hand like Ace-8 offsuit or Queen-8 suited, yeah, sure, he's going to continue that with his hand. But Doug is going to hit a lot more 8s. I'm expecting a much bigger bet this time if Doug does in fact bet. I would imagine he even goes over pot. Let's see. And okay, I'm right about this one. Nice. So Doug goes for around 150% pot, which is definitely a cool sizing. He bet kind of small on the flop. He overbets a turn. That's a classic pie solver line. I really like that. Daniel eventually makes the call. So when Daniel makes the call here, I would say the majority of his range is a king here. If he had a 3, he's probably folding. If he had a 7, he'll mix it up. An 8 is pretty unlikely, so... I'm imagine I imagine he has a hand like King-9 here, a decent amount. 5 is an okay card for Doug. I mean, 6-4 gets there, but, you know, he probably doesn't overbet hands like King-5 or 7-5. A lot of his open-enders and gut shots miss, so... But at the same time, you know, if he has a hand like King Queen, his hand is still looking good, right? I mean, what are you beat by? You're you're beat by some hands like seven, eight, King Five, but not enough hands to make you want to check behind. So I'm expecting a big bet by Doug, at least nine or ten K, but could be more. And it's a whole lot more. Damn, it's a three X pot all in. So when Sh Doug shoves all in here, he's not repping a hand like King Queen anymore. He's representing at least a hand like you know King Five, King Seven. King five, I think he doesn't overbet on the turn. So he's representing king seven, king eight plus, sets, straights. So Doug is saying, hey, I've got the nine six suited. I don't think you do. Fuck you. I'm shoving three times pot, which is a really cool play. And now Daniel's going into the tank. He's got a king, maybe he blocks a straight. And he's thinking, well, I've top pair. You know, my blockers are kind of good. But then again, is Doug really shoving all in here for three times the pot enough of the time? So a really sick spot. So unless Doug's, uh, unless Doug's hand is ridiculous, this is a really strong play by him. I imagine Daniel calls, otherwise it would be a little bit boring. From what we know, Daniel is a bit of a calling station. So maybe he, you know, maybe he's going to call here every single time he has a king or something like a, a pair with a straight blocker. And eventually, can, can blame Daniel for tanking, of course. I mean, he's facing a $41,000 bet into a pot of 13k, right? So I really have to think that one through. All right, guys, wake me up. Wake me up when the one Daniel once Daniel has called. Wow. Okay. Okay. So Doug ends up shoving with King Seven, which we thought was probably one of the weakest hands he could have. Um, but I think it's a good play. I mean, he sees a flop of top two parry, overbets a turn, and on the river he knows, well, I'm never really behind unless Daniel has, lets a slow play threes or sevens on the flop, which is pretty unlikely, especially given the fact that he has a seven, or king eight offsuit, which to be fair is a hand that Daniel can definitely have. So, And Daniel called here with two pair, which, you know, in theory, heads up against a very good player, you'd probably have to end up calling. But then again, it's not as great as it looks, right? Because, I mean, Doug is not representing... Well, maybe he's representing King 3. So, but, you know, at the same time, it is not a great spot. You know, you don't block the relevant sets very well. You don't block the straight. So, but I think Daniel's play is pretty good. So, I'll give Daniel a... I'll give him a 9 out of 10. I think the preflop call is good. 
I like the flop check call. I like the flop at the turn check call. And on the river, I don't think you should fold against a very competent player. If you're facing some kind of nitrag who only shoves the nuts, yeah, sure, go ahead and fold. But against a guy like Doug, I think you can just go ahead and call this one. Obviously, you're not happy about it. And as for Doug, I'll give him a 9 out of 10 as well. In fact, I'll give him a 9.5 out of 10. So I really like his play as well. Nice hand. Can Doug bluff here with this huge overbet? Well, he should, right? Otherwise, Daniel shouldn't be calling with a, with a decent hand like this. Daniel Negreanu makes it $1,000 on the button. Doug says, no, 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 you're going to pay. I'm going to make it 4110 especially that $10. You know, that's what really does it. Board is king, eight, five. And this is kind of an innocent board. You know, Daniel will have pocket fives and eights, king, five, king, eight. He will have some hands like king, queen, whatnot. So he will improve a decent amount. But then again, Doug will improve a bunch as well with hands like pocket eights, pocket kings. So... It's a pretty solid board for both of them. Not a whole lot is happening in the sense that there's only, you know, one open ender out there. There's no flusher out there. You know, there's only one overcard out there. It's kind of dry. So I'm expecting a small. And as I say that, Doug bets really small. Bet on the flop. Daniel's ma main play here is going to be call. The queen is a, you know, pretty okay card for both of them. Daniel's going to float some hands like ace, queen, queen, jack, whatnot. So he'll improve a bunch. He can also have king, queen. And same goes for Doug. I'm not sure whether or not Doug will bet his whole range on this board, but he's definitely betting a lot. I'm expecting a bigger bet now. Bigger bet it is. So the pot is going to be around 32k if Daniel were to call. So he'll have about two-thirds pot left. Good sizing by Doug. The river seven doesn't really change anything. I mean, I guess nine, six of hearts or six, four of hearts, but, you know, pretty irrelevant. I guess Daniel could have a hand like seven, five or eight, seven of hearts. But this river doesn't change a whole lot. If Doug has a hand like ace, king, he can still comfortably shove. And yeah, he could be behind, but can only shove when you have the nuts. So Doug does shove and Daniel did not snap call. So that's good for Doug, right? If he gets snapped, then he probably loses. Okay. Doug has ace jack here. Okay. So Doug three bets pre, absolutely the fine play at the best play. He C bets a flop. You know, this is not the greatest C betting hand, so that tells me he's probably betting his full range or at least close to it. On the turn, on the queen, he can still bet very aggressively. Ace jack is a hand you could definitely turn into a bluff sometimes. On the river, though, I mean, it's not the greatest hand to bluff with, right? You've got the jack of hearts, which kind of sucks. I mean, imagine if Daniel has jack eight of hearts. You open pre-flop, you call the three bet, you call the flop, you call the turn with the flush on the river, you probably fold, right? So when you block that hand, it's now a bit less likely that Daniel folds. So yeah, I think that Doug is a little bit too loose here. Uh, Daniel with his call, I think it's just one of those spots where you got to close your eyes and call. Uh, I guess call and then close your eyes so you don't accidentally click the full button. But yeah, pre-flip is fine. Flop, turn, river, it's fine. You are bluff catching. I think Doug probably shoves around king, jack, plus here. So you're not beating value bets, but Doug is an aggressive player. So I can definitely see him bluffing enough to make Daniel want to call this hand. So I'll give Daniel a 10, I guess. It's a very easy play, but I like to play. I'll give Doug a seven and a half. I think his idea is good, but it's a little bit aggressive especially against a guy like Daniel, who is not known for hero folds. So, cool hand. How long does it take you to move to high stakes? Um, that really depends. And guys, don't focus on that. You know, So for me, it went very quickly. Uh, but the thing is, there's no, there's no monetary you know, reward for get, getting the high stakes quickly. Get there properly. So, yeah, don't focus on how quickly you get somewhere. Even if, if you say, I want to get from NL50 to NL200, don't focus on getting there quickly. You know, if you play there underskilled and underrolled, are you then are you then now proud of yourself? No, just move up gradually. Don't do anything stupid. And, you know, it's just an arbitrary accomplishment. The same as setting a monetary goal, right? Don't say, oh, I'm going to make 50K in poker this year. What if, let's say, halfway throughout the year, you already made 40K? Are you now going to be lazy? right? Because you're, you're close. What if you're down 5k? Are you just going to give up because there's no way you'll get there? Or are you going to work much harder? Don't think about that. Work hard, hard, work hard, put in a lot of volume, grind a lot, put in good work off the table, you know, play good games only, no rec games or no super low EV games, just push hard in good games. And whatever happens, happens. You know, poker is too unpredictable to make too many uh, assumptions, right? Just keep on working hard, consistently working hard. It's a marathon, not a sprint. Work hard, play good games, study a lot, grind a lot, and you will see results. 
But the reason a lot of people don't don't get there is because they're just not willing to work hard, right? They find some kind of excuse and ta- they take a victim role rather than just staying strong, just pushing through and just working really hard, right? All right, guys and girls, that has been it for me. What do you think about these hands? Let me know in the comments down below. If you want to see more videos like this, make sure to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel so you never miss out on future episodes. Also, make sure to grab my brand new free training series that would help you make more money playing poker without studying more before it expires. You will find the link in the description down below. See you next time and thanks for watching.